Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, choir. Miss you all. Miss everyone. I appreciate the, the welcome that uh, has been shown to me and, and helping with my office and all that good stuff. And uh, Bobby Joe told me he does his best preaching when he's drinking. I thought it was water. I didn't know about Mine's water, so Jimmy, I, I know your last name and all that, so we got that straight and everything, but I'm happy to be here. My wife Katrina's happy to be here. Before I get started, uh, I just want to say sometimes you may see me in the morning, and I have these marks all over my face. I promise my wife doesn't beat me, at least that's what I'm, she paid me to say, but I wear a CPAP at night after my stroke, so if you ever see that, I'm married, I'm happily married, but that's what it is. So just FYI, you'll see me sometimes in the morning and the, the marks that fade off. But anyways, if you don't mind, be taking God's Word and be turning to 1 Corinthians 1. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1, or uh, if you have your device, turn there in your device. Just don't be going to Pokemon Go or checking the UK Auburn box score right now. Uh, but meet me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And beginning in verse 1, it says... Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech, in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you were, excuse me, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end. Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In 1883, there was a man by the name of Horace Wilcox, who was a Jesus-loving man, and he was moving from the Midwest to out west, to Southern California, and when he did that, he bought a, a huge uh, parcel of land just north of the Los Angeles uh, downtown area. And when he bought this land, he had a vision for it. This place wasn't just going to be a place for him to just kick back and, and shuffleboard his, his way in retirement, you know, until uh, Jesus came back or, or Jesus called him home. But no, Horace had a vision for this land. He wanted this to be a place where Christians could come and gather in community, and, and where they could just lock arms with one another, where they could change the world for the glory of God. Well, Horace Wilcox, he was so serious uh, about this that he divvied up parcels of this land and he gave it to uh, a large you know, church denomination in the hopes that they would plant churches right where that land was located. Well, he wanted the churches planted, the, the gospel proclaimed, and to see people come to know Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That was his vision. Good vision, right? That was his vision. And you may say, well, Victor, what did he name this place? Well, he was a wise man, and he left the naming up to his wife. And she decided to name this place that they had this vision for, this place that was uh, meant to change the world for the glory of God after their favorite Midwestern country estate, an estate named Hollywood. That's right, Hollywood. Hollywood was originally bought by Christians so that it would be a place that would change the world for the glory of God. Needless to say, Hollywood has never lived up to that vision. Years prior, you have the Apostle Paul. Paul walked into a place called Corinth, and he had a vision 
He wanted to see people from all walks of life to come and know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we know this because Paul writes in Romans 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe. To the Jew not only, but to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So Paul. He has this vision, he plants this church, he, he, he has this dream that the church would change its community, that it would change the world, and all of it done for the glory of God. Well, years later, he sits down and writes the letter because he understands that the church of Corinth has veered off mission. They were not living into that vision that God had designed them to, to live. So the church of Corinth, to put it simply, they were a hot mess. They were a hot mess. They were divided. They were uh, at each other's throats. They were living in morality. Sin seemed to be running rapid in, in the church. And, and in fact, Paul says in chapter 5, you know, some of the stuff that you all into, not even the Gentiles do this. Not even the pagans are this bad, is what Paul's saying. And so they had veered off course. Sadly, many churches, they fit this bill. That spiritual uh, complacency has taken place. And this isn't just true of the church. It's true for all of us as individuals, not just collectively, as the hymn writer says, Chad, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. And that's us sometimes. And so Paul said to the Romans in, in chapter 7, the things that I do, I don't even want to do. Uh oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So parenthetically, aren't you thankful for the grace of God? That grace steps in when, when sin abounds, that grace takes over. So here you have Corinth, and here you have Paul, and he sits down to this church who has veered off course, and what does he say to them? I give thanks to God for you. Well, wait a minute, Paul. They don't deserve your gratitude. But Paul says, I give thanks to God for you. Even though in chapter 3 he calls him carnal and fleshly, Paul says, I give thanks to God for you. Even though in chapter 5 he says, one of you all are sleeping with your own stepmother, Paul says, I give thanks to God for you. Even though in chapter 6 they're dragging one another to court, Paul says, I give thanks to God for you. Even though in chapters 8 and 9, they're dividing over uh, little stuff like food offered to idols, Paul says, I give thanks to God for you. Even though in chapter 11, they're making a mockery of the Lord's Supper, Paul says, I give thanks to God for you. Even though in chapters 12 and 14, they're taking their gifts that the Holy Spirit had given them for the glorification of the body, uh, of the glory of the Lord, they're using them for their own narcissistic glorification. Paul says, I give thanks to God for you. So even though the Corinthian church had given the Apostle Paul every reason to tap out on the church, Paul says, I ain't tapping out on you, I'm doubling down on the church. So... I want to talk about this morning about doubling down on the church, the importance of the church. So I know we're, often we come to church and we're used to coming and hearing about the Word of God being uh, applicable uh, to each and every one of us as, as individuals, and, and that's true. There's some good secondary application I want to give you this morning. But please notice who this is addressed to. It is not addressed to so much to the individual, it is addressed to the church. So we need to hear this, especially after the last couple of years. The body of Christ in America, like the church in Corinth, has been a hot mess. 
Uh, there's been division in the body of Christ. Uh, in some places, uh, there's been racial division. Uh, there's been uh, political division in the body of Christ. And we've been divided, and, and then you add things like a, a global pandemic, and some people say, well, well, wear a mask. Others are saying not. Some are saying trust God and get the vaccine, and others, you know, say the, the opposite, even though there's probably two epidemiologists in the whole state of Kentucky. You know, no one really knows, but, you know, there's this division. There's this back and forth. There's this divisiveness. And, and all at the same time, guess what? The world's looking at us. People are looking at God's people, at the church. Uh, so even sometimes in, 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 in could be any church, we look how other so-called Christians treat one another, and they're tapping out, so I'm done. I'm done. I, I, can't, I can't do this. I love Jesus. I just don't like his kids. And I remember meeting with a friend. We, we used to attend church together. And he said, Victor, you know, I'll be honest. I just can't do church anymore. Because he's seen the trauma of how church folk have treated each other. And, and maybe, maybe you're here, maybe you're just dangling by a thread. Others of you, you're locked in. And I hope this is a, a reminder that God doesn't want us to tap out on his church, that he wants us to double down on his church. And, and why is that? Well, this morning I'm going to give you two reasons why, and I'm going to give you two reasons how. So first reason that we should look, double down, when we look at the, the panorama perspective of, of Scripture, in the Bible, God often uses and works through the we's. Not the me's. The we's. In the Bible, the primary way God rose to advance his purpose throughout history is through we's, not me's. And in the old covenant, the we's was the nation of Israel. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, here's God. Here's a man named uh, Abram. Later on, he would change his name to Abraham. And he says to him that he has a coin on his life. I'm going to make a, a great nation from you. But the point of this great nation isn't, you know, for the, the sake of the great nation. I'm going to use this nation, this collection of people, to bless the world. I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that, that curse you. I'm going to use my people to reach the world. And the rest of the Old Testament is just the, the, the unfolding of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, remember Old Testament Joseph. God takes Joseph, puts him second in command in, 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 of the world superpower, Egypt. And the world literally seeks an audience with this Jew who navigates them through famine. Again, God using Israel to bless the world. You have the story of, of Daniel. He's a Jew in exile in this foreign nation of, uh, of Babylon, and he leads this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, to faith. But the ultimate example of the Abrahamic covenant is the king of the Jews, Jesus Christ. He dies on the cross for the world, and the world is blessed through Jesus Christ. But now in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, God calls an audible God says, I'm no longer just going to work through the nation of Israel. I'm also going to work through the church of Jesus Christ. That's you and me. So who's the Jews? It's not just the Jews. It's also the non-Jews. It's the, in child, the, the, the Gentiles. It's, it's everybody. And, and in verse 2, Paul says, not to the individual, but to the church of God that is in Corinth. Okay? So what he's saying is that God wants to use the church of Corinth to advance his purposes. Paul, Paul might as well be saying this to Papa Row Baptist Church right now. <clears throat> this is addressed to the we's of the local church. 
Which means that if you're not part of the local church, then you're not part of plan A that God has for reaching the world. God's plan A is to advance His purposes through His people, through His church. That's why it's nails on the chalkboard to hear someone say, well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm spiritual, but I'm not, I'm not religious or believe in organized religion. You ever heard of that one? You know, as a church, we're supposed to be the bride of Christ, right? That's like me saying, I'm married, but I'm not going home. Well, I may be married, but my relationship's going to suffer, right? I don't know about how your spouse rolls, but that's not going to fly with my wife. Uh, I'm not going to call and say, you know, Katrina, I'm married in my heart, but, uh, you know, I'm going with Bambi and Trixie over here and hanging out. I'm not doing that. But that's how many people in America that call themselves followers of Jesus behave. Uh, a North African theologian said that, you know, uh, we can't claim to have God as our father without church as our mother. Uh, some truth to that. If you know church history and, and American history, then you're probably familiar with the name Roger Williams. Roger Williams was a Puritan. And the Puritans were people, they, they came over here from, from England, and the whole aspiration of the Puritans was to create the pure church. The pure church. And, and what they meant from that is that they were going to disentangle the church from the state from the, from the, 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 that was over there in, in England. They wanted to start a pure church, which again, parenthetically, just blows my mind because these Puritans at the same time, a lot of them still had plays, but whatever. And, and there's this Puritan by the name of Roger Williams who comes over here, and he's, he's like a Puritan on steroids. And he comes over here, and he's going to start a church up in Massachusetts. And <clears throat> people start to show up. And is the case when people show up, problems arise. Well, Roger Williams, he, he sees the people. He sees the problems. He says, I'm tapping out. I'm going to Rhode Island, and I want to start a church over there. Well, it's a perfect church until the people show up. And when the people show up, problems arise. He leaves that church to go start another church and another church and another church. People show up, problems arise. He taps out. And on and on, Roger goes, and here's the cycle of Roger Williams. First, he, he reads the New Testament carefully. Uh, second, he, he discovers the glories of what church should be. Third, he, he plants a new church. Fourth, he, he gets discouraged. Fifth, he leaves the church. And, and sixth, Bobby Joe, he starts the whole cycle all over again. That's many people today. People leave church because in their minds they're looking for a perfect place. And when they don't see that, they leave. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he wrote, Those who love their dream of the Christian community more than the Christian community itself becomes destroyers of the Christian community. Even though their personal intentions may ever be so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. So what all Dietrich is saying here, he, he says the reason why people church hop is because so many people are more in love with the ideal rather than the real. We may never say this, but this is how we act. We're going to come to Poplar Grove. Man, I've heard so much about it. The music's great. Uh, the pastor's great. You know, I've got to come. I've got I to gotta check this place out. Then you come here. Lo and behold, someone gossips about you. I'm out. Lo and behold, someone tells a lie. I'm out. Lo and behold, you see one thing wrong and you're out as if the next place is going to be perfect. Is that you? We're, we're so in love with the ideal that we cannot embrace the real. So why should I double down on God's church? Paul secondly says in, in verse 4, he says, I give thanks to my God always for you, that's in the plural, in the Greek, because of the grace of God was given you, plural, 
in Christ Jesus that in every way you, plural, were enriched. So the idea of the phrase were enriched in the Greek is to make wealthy. So how were you enriched? Well, in all speech and, and in all knowledge. So these are two spiritual gifts that the Corinthians seem to be so uh, fascinated with. Speech is tongues. Knowledge is prophecy. And then verse 6, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. Again, who's the you? The church. So that you are not lacking any gift. So why double down on the church? He says that you should double down on the church because it's in the church where God has placed everything you need in order to flourish. In order to flourish. It's all here. And we bought in America so often everything I need is right here. It's in me. But Paul says to the Corinthians, you're not lacking in everything, but the you is not the individual. The you is the body of believers. So when you get to chapters 12 and 14, when he talks about spiritual gifts, he uses the imagery of the body. And listen to what he says. Not a single of the body, excuse me, single member of our body can turn to the rest of the body and say, I have no need of you. So we're connected. We need each other. We need one another. So for me not to double down on the church is to disconnect myself from God's primary means of growing me and maturing me. So I need other people in my life. That's how God's designed me. God himself is three in one. There's unity amongst diversity. So one of the greatest lies that the enemy can tell us is, is that when you get disappointed with people, is that you have that thing that comes to mind that says, I don't need anybody. I don't need them. Some of you know me better than, than others. Uh, I grew up not far from here. At, my home church had grown up at Central Baptist. And, you know, it wasn't a perfect place like no church was, but we had community. We cared about each other. We're connected. And there were some faithful, salt of the earth uh, people who loved Jesus Double down on, on, on the church. They were there for me after my dad's suicide and my mom and, and all these things. But I remember as a kid, I tried to honor father and mother, whether I wanted to or not. I did what my mom wanted me to do. And one of those, sometimes, I'm on, I can't lie, uh, one of those things was going to Bible drills. And the, the two people, you may know them, that told them was Rita and Warren Hill. And I went, and they were great, and it was a good time. And they cared about us. And every time we met, they would go to Dairy Queen and buy blizzards for the kids. Except me, because I'm an oddball and don't like ice cream. They would buy me chicken strips. They, they, they would pour into the lives of their kids, of these kids. They were faithful. They doubled down on the church. Uh, Ruth Matters, who used to sit on the back, she would always have some candy for the kids. She was Always so nice and kind. I remember when I worked at Kroger, I would take her groceries out on her license plate. It says, live your life so the pastor doesn't have to lie at your funeral. You know, you know? I, I, I remember when Katrina and I, we got married, and she's the one who ripped me away from this church to begin with, so put it on her. But we went to, to Louisville, and we went to Parkland Baptist Church. You don't know this woman. There's a woman there named Merlene Quiggins. She was the salt earth woman. She had a she had a mental disability, but she made sure she was there faithfully in Sunday school and in worship every Sunday. And you, she used to send some of the nicest cards to me, Katrina, uh, other folks. We'd come in there every Sunday. She'd give a big hug and ask, how's my girlfriend doing? You better take good care of her and, and all these things. I think about where I just came from, a man named Marvin Bodine. When I first came to First Cedar Creek Baptist Church, I didn't really know anyone there in Bardstown. Uh, but Marvin, he befriended me, befriended Trina. And, and me and Marvin, we'd travel around. We'd see different people. And I would joke, you know, Marvin's the mayor of Bardstown. He knows everybody, and everyone loves him. And, and I was there for months before I realized Marvin had a prosthetic leg. And saving someone's life at a factory, he, he lost his leg. Marvin had every reason to complain in life, but he didn't 
and he was a blessing to myself and to Katrina and so many other people. And I, I met so many people because of him. So I've got so many people. I could go on after on and on and on. People I have to thank in my life. People whom the world is not worthy. People who have showed up and doubled down on the church. There are no unimportant people in the church. Every single one of you is, a, is important. Every single one of you have a gift. God wants to use each and every single one of you. We come here, here not just to worship, not just to sit on our blessed assurances, but to get involved, to serve. To, people's going to pour into you, you're going to pour into other people, and we're going to glorify God together. His church is where that all happens. So all of us have gifts. All of us. And who knows what, what lives you are changing for, for the time that you're here that, that you don't see. So that's why we don't need consumer Christians. We need people who, who show up and say, Lord, I'm going to offer you the little bit that I have. Multiply it. Bless it. Use it. Not for me, but for your glory. So, so how do we double down on the church? Two things. Paul says, I'm not giving up on you. I'm not, I'm not tapping out on you. I'm doubling down. Verse 2, notice what he, calls, what he says. He says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified. Now, the idea of the word sanctified means to set apart. To set apart. It's the idea that there is a pile of something, and God reaches down into this pile and taking some out of that pile and setting them apart. So who has he set apart? It's the church. It's the church. It's like Grandma's china cabinet. That fine china doesn't come out when, when you want to, you know, get some hot dogs and bologna sandwiches or, or a midday snack. Those things, they're sanctified. You only bust out the fine china for a special reason, for some sort of special occasion, special meal. Do not let Grandma catch you eating a PB&J sandwich on, on her fine china, sit in a lazy boy chair where you watch Keeping Up the Kardashians. That, that is not what it's for. That stuff only comes out for special occasions. It's set apart. So Paul is saying you ain't regular, you ain't common, uh, you ain't a paper plate. You're like grandma's fine china. You're set apart. You're different. You're sanctified. So what makes you different isn't because you're all that in a bag of chips. What makes you different is that God put himself inside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul would say, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So you've been set apart, Poplar Grove. You've been set apart. There are three tenses of salvation. There's three tenses of salvation, of, of sanctification. First, there's past tense. When, when you got saved, <clears throat> there was this one-time act. When you confessed with your mouth and you believed in your heart that, that Jesus is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and, and you're going to follow him. And that one act, you got saved. And then there's future tense salvation. It's the day that God's either going to Jesus is going to come back, or God's going to bring us home to our eternal home and, and a new glorified body, which I'm hoping has a faster metabolism. But the problem is, right now, <laughs> we're in the sweet by and by. We're, we're, we're in the present tense. Present tense salvation is the process by which God is making you to be who He has already declared you to be, and that's to be holy. That's why Philippians 2 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, <clears throat> both to will and to do for his good pleasure. When I was a kid, we would sing, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. That's close I get to the choir, Chad. But, but, <laughs> I'm just joking. but we're, my dad said someone has to listen, but uh, we're works in progress, Right? We're works in progress. We ain't all the way there yet either. So I've been set apart, and I'm glad you're all sitting down for this. But there's times I don't act like it. There's times I don't act like it. 
<sighs> before I got saved, you know, I might cuss at a drop of a hat. But now since following Jesus, probably y'all I don't cuss so fast anymore. Right? And I'm not condoning cussing. I'm just joking. But, but what I'm saying is don't act like you're perfect. We're all works in progress. Every single one of us. I was single long enough to partake in the age of online dating. Sorry, Mom. Uh, maybe some of you have partaken in this. Uh, you know, you would see, or I'd see a photo of a girl like, well, she's attractive. Hopefully she loves the Lord. Let's find out, right? And, and then you show up to see her at a, a restaurant or a coffee shop, and, and you see her, and you're just amazed at what some of these filters can do online. How it can change a person's uh, appearance. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, uh, but that person looks nothing like their picture. But it's a problem that sin distorts our picture of who we should be. God says, I've declared you, Papa Grove, to be holy. Now, <laughs> sanctification present tense says we're in the process of being made to look like our picture. But tell the truth, there's some days we don't act like it. Sit me down in, in, in a close UK ball game and it puts my sanctification to the test. So here's what I'm saying. Anyone who taps out on the church because they come into the church and they see people say stuff they shouldn't, uh, treat folks the way they shouldn't, do stuff the way they shouldn't, and, and they say, I'm tapping on the church, well, they have a flawed theology when it comes to sanctification. When, when I really get that you and I, that we're all in the process, that I'm a sinner, that I'm undone, that I'm sitting next to the other sinners, when I get that, I have a healthy theology of sanctification. It sets the table for me to be patient. That we're working this thing out together. We can be such hypocrites, can't we? Every day, you and I, we receive the patience of God, but we're impatient with His kids. So how do I double down on the church? I'm patient with the people of God. We're in a process. Poplar Grove is a safe place for you to process your sin. Poplar Grove is a safe place to come here and say, I don't have it all together. We can now double down because Paul says in verse 4, I give thanks to my God always for you. Why, Paul? Because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. In other words, I can authentically celebrate you, not because you deserve it, because you receive grace. And what's grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace means you didn't eat your dinner, but you still got the dessert. Our problem when it comes to grace is that many of us, we have short story grace, not full story grace. Short story grace says, I was a rich, I was a sinner, I was so messed up, but God saved me. Yes and amen. But grace isn't just what he saved you from. Grace is also what he has called you to. Full story grace says he didn't just save me from my sins, but he calls me into fellowship with him. He calls me into relationship with him. Some psychiatrists have a, psychiatrists have a, a term for what I'm trying to say. It's called fundamental attribution error. All that means is when I ascribe to you and your behavior, you know, I just say those are character issues. Uh, I do that to you, but when it comes to me, I just say, well, it's just, it's just mitigating circumstances. So what they're saying is, if I'm, if I'm late to work, well, it's because my dog threw up, I got into it with my wife, and there was traffic on the way here. But if you're late to work, well, he's lazy. She's a bum. So what this is saying is we're really good at giving grace to ourselves and horrible at giving grace to others. We are promiscuous in, in lavishing ourselves with grace. But when it comes to others, tell the truth, we're celibate. We love to keep grace on ourselves, but we withhold it from other folk. 
So every day I mess up, and what is awaiting me is not condemnation. It is not God tapping out on me. He keeps wanting relationship with me. So to be a Christian means that in some shape or form or fashion, I pass that on to other people. So for the people to, to leave the church and say it's too judgmental, I'm out, you've done the same thing to others that you've accused them to do. So if you double down on the church, folks, if you're here long enough, we'll miss you over. But do you have grace? Are you patient? Paul says you're able to do this. You're able to double down. You're able to show incredible patience. You're able to show incredible grace. Why? Verse 8, Jesus, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is saying, I'm not giving up on the church because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this church ain't about me. It's not man's idea. It's not man's product. It's in God's hand. He's the one who started it. He's the one who began a good work in you who will be faithful to complete it. So we're going to go home on this. World War II, true story. There is this Navy ship called the Astoria that was, that was in this great uh, battle. And it experienced this intense battle and ended up sinking. Well, there was this guy by the name of Elgin Staples. He got, <clears throat> when he was there in the, in the Astoria, he got, he got shot out and thrust overboard. And, and when he did, praise God, his, his life belt trigger, triggered and activated and it kept him afloat for for several hours while he waited to be rescued and as he's floating around for hours well he doesn't have anything to do but study his life belt and finally he he's rescued he's taken back home to akron ohio and he sits down with his mother and elgin's curious because his mother works at the firestone plant that makes these life belts and he's telling his mom everything about what, what happened, the, the battle, being in the ocean for hours. And says, Mother, I, I noticed on the life belt, there's these series of numbers on it. What, what are those numbers about, Mom? And his mother says, oh, you, you, you got to understand, the government is very meticulous. They want accountability. So anytime that we make a, a life belt, the person who makes it, well, they have this special set of uh, of numbers that are, are unique to them that to ensure accountability and authenticity, they ascribe those same numbers to the life belt. And then his mother said, just curious, Elgin, do you remember the numbers on your life belt? Well, Elgin said, do I? I stared at it for hours. She said, well, tell me those numbers. Well, he, he rattled them off. She paused and said, tell me the numbers again. He told her again. And you know where I'm going with this. With tears in her eyes, she said, son, that is the serial number, number that belongs to me. I made that life belt. Isn't it something that the one who gave him birth, who brought him up in the world, is the one who helped sustain him? Poplar Grove. I want you to understand that this church isn't your church. It's not mine as co-pastor or Bobby Joe's. God's numbers are on this church. It belongs to him. And what he began, he will sustain. And what's true of, of this will be true in, in your life. So some of you came here today and you're thinking, I don't know how much more I can take the, the problems, the pressures. Well, I want you to know that God's faithful. He won't let you sink. He won't let you drown. So I just want to ask you, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I'm not asking you, are you religious? I'm asking, do you have a relationship with the one who saves you, who, who offers to save you, who, who sets you apart? So if you don't know him, here in a minute, we're going to sing a song. I'll be up the front. Bobby Joe will be at the front. And we can talk to you. Or maybe you've been coming here and you've been going here a while and God's saying, this is a church that you belong to. And you're going to make that public and join. Maybe it's to be baptized. Whatever God is calling you to do this morning, don't leave without doing so. Let's pray. 
Our Father in God, I just pray if you're calling someone to make some sort of decision today, whether it's to follow you for the first time or to join this church or to be baptized or to repent and just get themselves right with you. Maybe they're already a believer, Lord. Whatever it is, Lord, you call us all in in different ways. And, And Lord, just help us to know what that is. Maybe we've been coming here and we've been gifted, but we've just been sitting here, Lord. Help us to to grow here, to be involved, to be part of a discipleship group, to be part of Sunday school, that we grow and mature, that it is your church that you use to, to grow us. And everything's already here. So God, we just thank you for your son and who he is and what he's done. And God, just help our lives to seek to glorify him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Just as I am poor You've heard the gospel preached today. You know what it takes to be what God wants you to be.
know the decision. The decision that would bring glory to God. Thank you for a wonderful message this morning. This is what we're in store for in the days ahead. I can promise you that. It's my joy today to share with you the coming of these two. They've been worshiping with us a while. Uh, this is Max and uh, Giovanna. How <laughs> about that? You didn't, you didn't think I could do that, did you? <laughs> Max and Giovanna Gomez. They've been worshiping with us a while. Max is a preacher boy, too, by the way. And uh, they live in our community, and they feel uh, that this is where the Lord wants them to serve and use our gifts. And so we're wonderfully glad to have you folks here. We look forward to serving with you in the days ahead. So if you rejoice in their decision to come from a sister church, the Poplar Grove Church, would you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. All right. That means we're going to love you and grow with you in the days ahead. And I'm going to ask if you would to stand here and let people come by and welcome you into the, into the fellowship of Poplar Grove Baptist Church. Max has been active with us in our men's ministry on uh, uh, Monday morning, and we've certainly enjoyed the input that he's given us, uh, given us there. Thank you for being here this morning. Now, tonight we have our Valentine's dinner, so we're going to have a, a, a brief service, I promise. I'll, I'll cut it in half or a third, and so you won't get home too late. Uh, with kids and all that. But it's going to be a wonderful time. You can sign up right there as you leave and uh, come tonight and be a part of our time together. Church directory, there'll be those out there if you'd like to sign up this morning. And let's get that, uh, let's get that full this year. Uh, even if you're not a member here, we still invite you to be a part of that. All right, thank you for being here this morning. And Victor, thank you for a, for a marvelous message. All right, Chad, lead us as we go. I am a friend of God. 